Chapter Six of the Sea Wolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sea Wolf by Jack London. Chapter Six. By the following morning, the storm had blown itself quite out, and the ghost was rolling slightly on a calm sea without a breath of wind. Occasional light airs were felt, however, and Wolf Larsen patrolled the poop constantly, his eyes ever searching the sea to the northeastward, from which direction the great trade winds must blow. The men were all on deck and busily preparing their various boats for the season's hunting. There were seven boats aboard, the captain's dinghy, and the six which the hunters will use. Three, a hunter, a boat puller, and a boat steerer, compose a boat's crew. On board the schooner, the boat pullers and steerers are the crew. The hunters, too, are supposed to be in command of the watches, subject, always, to the orders of Wolf Larsen. All this and more I have learned. The ghost is considered the fastest schooner in both the San Francisco and Victoria fleets. In fact, she was once a private yacht and was built for speed. Her lines and fittings, though I know nothing about such things, speak for themselves. Johnson was telling me about her in a short chat I had with him during yesterday's second dog watch. He spoke enthusiastically, with the love for a fine craft such as some men feel for horses. He is greatly disgusted with the outlook, and I am given to understand that Wolf Larsen bears a very unsavory reputation among the sealing captains. It was the ghost herself that lured Johnson in the signing for the voyage, but he is already beginning to repent. As he told me, the ghost is an eighty-ton schooner of a remarkably fine model. Her beam, or width, is twenty-three feet, and her length a little over ninety feet. A lead keel of fabulous but unknown weight makes her very stable, while she carries an immense spread of canvas. From the deck to the trunk of the main top mast is something over a hundred feet, while the foremast with its top mast is eight or ten feet shorter. I am giving these details so that the size of this little floating world, which holds twenty-two men, may be appreciated. It is a very little world, a moat, a speck, and I marvel that men should dare to venture the sea on a contrivance so small and fragile. Wolf Larsen has, also, a reputation for reckless carrying on of sail. I overheard Henderson and another of the hunters, Standish, a Californian, talking about it. Two years ago he dismasted the ghost in a gale on Bering Sea, whereupon the present masts were put in, which are stronger and heavier in every way. He is said to have remarked, when he put them in, that he preferred turning her over to losing the sticks. Every man aboard, with the exception of Johansen, who is rather overcome by his promotion, seems to have an excuse for having sailed on the ghost. Half the men forward are deep-water sailors, and their excuse is that they did not know anything about her or her captain. And those who do know whisper that the hunters, while excellent shots, were so notorious for their quarrelsome and rascally proclivities that they could not sign on any decent schooner. I have made the acquaintance of another one of the crew, Lewis, he is called, a rotund and jovial-faced Nova Scotia Irishman, and a very sociable fellow, prone to talk as long as he can find a listener. In the afternoon, while the cook was below asleep and I was peeling the everlasting potatoes, Lewis dropped into the galley for a yarn. His excuse for being aboard was that he was drunk when he signed. He assured me again and again that it was the last thing in the world he would dream of doing in a sober moment. It seems that he had been seal hunting regularly each season for a dozen years, and is accounted one of the two or three very best boat steerers in both fleets. Ah, my boy, he shook his head ominously at me. Tis the worst schooner ye could have selected, nor were ye drunk at the time as was I. Tis sealin' is the sailor's paradise on other ships than this. 
The mate was the first, but mark me words, there'll be more dead men before the trip is done with. Hist now between you and meself and the stanchion there, this Wolf Larsen is a regular devil, and the ghost'll be a hell ship like she's always been since he had hold of her. Don't I know? Don't I know? Don't I remember him and Hokeda two years gone when he had a row and shot four of his men? Wasn't I a lion on the Emma L not three hundred yards away? And there was a man the same year he killed with a blow of his fist. Yes, sir, killed him dead o. His head must have smashed like an eggshell. And wasn't there the governor of Kura Island and the chief of police, Japanese gentlemen, sir? And didn't they come aboard the ghost as his guests a bringing their wives along? we and pretty little bits of things like you see him painted on fans and as he was a getting under way didn't the fond husbands get left astern like in their sampan as it might be by accident and wasn't it a week later that the poor little ladies was put ashore on the other side of the island with nothing before em but to walk home across the mountains on their weeny teeny little straw sandals which wouldn't hang together a mile don't i know tis the beast he is this wolf larsen the great big beast mentioned if in revelation and no good end will he ever come to but i've said nothing to ye mind ye i've whispered never a word for fat old lewis will live the voyage out if the last mother's son of ye is go to the fishes wolf larsen he snorted a moment later listen to the word will ye wolf "'Tis what he is. He's not black-hearted like some men. "'Tis no heart he has at all. "'Wolf, just wolf, tis what he is. "'Do ye wonder he's well-named? "'But if he is so well-known for what he is,' I queried, "'how is it that he can get men to ship with him? "'And how is it ye can find men to do anything on God's earth and sea?' "'Lewis demanded with Celtic fire.' How do ye find me aboard if it wasn't that I was drunk as a pig when I put me name down? There's them that can't sail with better men, like the hunters, and them that don't know, like the poor devils of windjammers forward there. But they'll come to it, they'll come to it, and be sorry the day they was born. I could weep for the poor creatures, did I but forget poor fat old Lewis and the troubles before him. But tis not a whisper I've dropped, mind ye, not a whisper. Them hunters is the wicked boys, he broke forth again, for he suffered from a constitutional plethora of speech. But wait till they get to cutting up of jinks and rowin' round. He's the boy will fix em. Tis him that'll put the fear of God in their rotten black hearts. Look at that hunter of mine, Horner. Jock Horner, they call him, so quiet-like and easy-goin'. Soft-spoken as a girl, till you'd think butter wouldn't melt in the mouth of him. Didn't he kill his boat steerer last year? Twas called a sad accident, but I met the boat puller in Yokohama, and the straight of it was given me. Then there's smoke, the black little devil. Didn't the Russians have him for three years in the salt mines of Siberia for poaching on Copper Island, which is a Russian preserve? shackled he was hand and foot with his mate and didn't they have words or a ruckus of some kind for twas the other fellow smoke sent up in the buckets to the top of the mine and a piece at a time he went up a leg to-day and to-morrow an arm the next day the head and so on but you can't mean it i cried out overcome with the horror of it mean what he demanded quick as a flash tis nothing i've said Deef I am, and dumb, as ye should be for the sake of your mother, and never once have I opened me lips but to say fine things of him, and him God curse his soul, and may he rot in purgatory ten thousand years, and then go down to the last and deepest hell of all. Johnson, the man who had chafed me raw when I first came aboard, seemed the least equivocal of the men forward or aft. In fact, there was nothing equivocal about him. One was struck at once by his straightforwardness and manliness, which in turn were tempered by a modesty which might be mistaken for timidity. But timid he was not. 
he seemed rather to have the courage of his convictions the certainty of his manhood it was this that made him protest at the commencement of our acquaintance against being called Janssen, and upon this and him lewis passed judgment and prophecy tis a fine chap that squarehead johnson we forward with us he said the best sailor man in the forecastle. he's my boat puller but it's to trouble he'll come with wolf larsen as the sparks fly upward it's meself that knows i can see it brewin and comin up like a storm in the sky i've talked to him like a brother but it's little he sees in takin in his lights or flyin false signals he grumbles out when things don't go to suit him and there'll always be some tale-tale carryin word of it after the wolf the wolf is strong and it's the way of a wolf to hate strength and strength it is he'll see in johnson no knucklin under and a yes sir thank ye kindly sir for a curse or a blow oh she's a comin she's a comin and god knows where i'll get another boat puller and what does the fool up and say when the old man calls him johnson but me name is johnson sir and then spells it out letter for letter you should have seen the old man's face i thought he'd let drive at him on the spot he didn't but he will and he'll break that square head's heart or as little i know of the ways of men on the ships of the sea thomas mugridge is becoming unendurable i am compelled to mister him and to sir him with every speech one reason for this is that wolf larsen seems to have taken a fancy to him it is an unprecedented thing i take it for the captain to be chummy with the cook but this is certainly what wolf larsen is doing two or three times he put his head into the galley and chafed mugridge good-naturedly and once this afternoon he stood by the break of the poop and chatted with him for fully fifteen minutes when it was over and mugridge was back in the galley he became greasily radiant and went about his work humming coster songs in a nerve-racking and discordant falsetto i always get along with the officers he remarked to me in a confidential tone i know the why i do to make myself appreciated there was my last skipper why i thought nothin of droppin down in the cabin for a little chat in a friendly glass mugridge says he to me mugridge says he you've missed your vacation and ow's that says i you should have been born a gentleman and never ad to work for your livin god strike me dead ump if that wasn't what he says and me a sittin there in his own cabin jolly like and comfortable a smokin his cigars and drinkin his rum this chitter-chatter drove me to distraction i never heard a voice i hated so his oily insinuating tones his greasy smile and his monstrous self-conceit grated on my nerves till sometimes i was all in a tremble positively he was the most disgusting and loathsome person i have ever met the filth of his cooking was indescribable and as he cooked everything that was eaten aboard i was compelled to select what i ate with great circumspection choosing from the least dirty of his concoctions my hands bothered me a great deal unused as they were to work the nails were discoloured and black while the skin was already grained with dirt which even a scrubbing brush could not remove then blisters came in a painful and never-ending procession and i had a great burn on my forearm acquired by losing my balance in the roll of the ship and pitching against the galley stove nor was my knee any better the swelling had not gone down and the cap was still up on edge hobbling about on it from morning till night was not helping it any what i needed was rest if it were ever to get well rest i never before knew the meaning of the word i had been resting all my life and did not know it but now could i sit still for one half hour and do nothing not even think it would be the most pleasurable thing in the world but it is a revelation on the other hand i shall be able to appreciate the lives of the working people hereafter i did not dream that work was so terrible a thing from half past five in the morning till ten o'clock at night i am everybody's slave with not one moment to myself 
except such as I can steal near the end of the second dog watch. Let me pause for a moment to look out over the sea sparkling in the sun, or to gaze at a sailor going aloft to the gaff topsails, or running out the bowsprit, and I am sure to hear the hateful voice. Here you, um, no soldierin. I've got my peepers on yer. There are signs of rampant bad temper in the steerage, and the gossip is going around that Smoke and Henderson have had a fight. Henderson seems the best of the hunters, a slow-going fellow and hard to rouse, but roused he must have been, for Smoke had a bruised and discolored eye, and looked particularly vicious when he came into the cabin for supper. A cruel thing happened just before supper, indicative of the callousness and brutishness of these men. There is one green hand in the crew, Harrison by name, a clumsy-looking country boy, mastered, I imagine, by the spirit of adventure and making his first voyage. In the light baffling airs the schooner had been tacking about a great deal, at which times the sails pass from one side to the other, and a man is sent aloft to shift over the foregaff topsail. In some way, when Harrison was aloft, the sheet jammed in the block through which it runs at the end of the gaff. As I understood it, there were two ways of getting it cleared. First, by lowering the foresail, which was comparatively easy and without danger, and second, by climbing out the peak halyards to the end of the gaff itself, an exceedingly hazardous performance. Johansen called out to Harrison to go out the halyards. It was patent to everybody that the boy was afraid. And well he might be, eighty feet above the deck, to trust himself on those thin and jerking ropes. Had there been a steady breeze, it would not have been so bad, but the ghost was rolling emptily in a long sea, and with each roll the canvas flapped and boomed, and the halyards slacked and jerked taut. They were capable of snapping a man off like a fly from a whiplash. Harrison heard the order and understood what was demanded of him, but hesitated. It was probably the first time he had been aloft in his life. Johansen, who had caught the contagion of Wolf Larsen's masterfulness, burst out with a volley of abuse and curses. "'That'll do, Johansen,' Wolf Larsen said brusquely. "'I'll have you know that I do the swearing on this ship. If I need your assistance, I'll call you in.' "'Yes, sir,' the mate acknowledged submissively. In the meantime, Harrison had started out on the halyards. I was looking up from the gully door, and I could see him trembling, as with ague, in every limb. He proceeded very slowly and cautiously, an inch at a time. Outlined against the clear blue of the sky, he had the appearance of an enormous spider crawling along the tracery of its web. It was a slight uphill climb, for the foresail peaked high, and the halyards running through the various blocks on the gaff and mast gave him separate holds for hands and feet. But the trouble lay in that the wind was not strong enough nor steady enough to keep the sail full. When he was halfway out, the ghost took a long roll to windward and back again into the hollow between two seas. Harrison ceased his progress and held on tightly. Eighty feet below I could see the agonized strain of his muscles as he gripped for very life. The sail emptied and the gaff swung amidships. The halyards slackened, and, though it all happened very quickly, I could see them sag beneath the weight of his body. Then the gag swung to the side with an abrupt swiftness, the great sail boomed like a cannon, and the three rows of reef points slatted against the canvas like a volley of rifles. Harrison, clinging on, made the giddy rush through the air. This rush ceased abruptly. The halyards became instantly taut. It was the snap of a whip. His clutch was broken. One hand was torn loose from its hold. The other lingered desperately for a moment and followed. His body pitched out and down, but in some way he managed to save himself with his legs. He was hanging by them, head downward. A quick effort brought his hands up to the halyards again, but he was a long time regaining his former position, where he hung, a pitiable object. 
"'I'll bet he has no appetite for supper,' I heard Wolf Larsen's voice, which came to me from around the corner of the galley. "'Stand out from under, you, Johansen. Watch out. Here she comes.' In truth, Harrison was very sick, as a person is seasick, and for a long time he clung to his precarious perch without attempting to move. Johansen, however, continued violently to urge him on to the completion of his task. "'It is a shame,' I heard Johnson growling in painfully slow and correct English. He was standing by the main rigging a few feet from me. "'The boy is willing enough. He will learn if he has a chance. But this is—' He paused a while, for the word murder was his final judgment. "'Hist, will ye?' Lewis whispered to him. "'For the love of your mother, hold your mouth.' but Johnson, looking on, still continued his grumbling. "'Look here,' the hunter Standish spoke to Wolf Larsen. "'That's my bolt-puller, and I don't want to lose him.' "'That's all right, Standish,' was the reply. "'He's your bolt-puller when you've got him in the boat, "'but he's my sailor when I have him aboard, "'and I'll do what I damn well please with him.' "'But that's no reason,' Standish began in the torrent of speech." "'That'll do. Easy as she goes,' Wolf Larsen counseled back. "'I've told you what's what, and let it stop at that. "'The man's mine, and I'll make soup of him and eat it if I want to.' "'There was an angry gleam in the hunter's eye, "'but he turned on his heel and entered the storage companionway, "'where he remained looking upward. "'All hands were on deck now, and all eyes were aloft, "'where a human life was at grapples with death.' The callousness of these men, to whom industrial organization gave control of the lives of other men, was appalling. I, who had lived out the whirl of the world, had never dreamed that its work was carried on in such a fashion. Life had always seemed a particularly sacred thing, but here it counted for nothing, it was a cipher in the arithmetic of commerce. I must say, however, that the sailors themselves were sympathetic as instanced the case of johnson but the masters the hunters and the captain were heartlessly indifferent even the protest of standish arose out of the fact that he did not wish to lose his boat puller had it been some other hunter's boat puller he like them would have been no more than amused but to return to harrison it took johansen insulting and reviling the poor wretch fully ten minutes to get him started again. A little later he made the end of the gaff, where, astride the spar itself, he had a better chance for holding on. He cleared the sheet, and was free to return, slightly downhill now, along the halyards to the mast. But he had lost his nerve. Unsafe as was his present position, he was loath to forsake it for the more unsafe position on the halyards. He looked along the airy path he must traverse, and then down to the deck. His eyes were wide and staring, and he was trembling violently. I had never seen fear so strongly stamped upon a human face. Johansen called vainly for him to come down. At any moment he was liable to be snapped off the gaff, but he was helpless with fright. Wolf Larsen, walking up and down with smoke and in conversation, took no more notice of him, though he cried sharply once to the man at the wheel, "'You're off your course, my man. Be careful, unless you're looking for trouble.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' the helmsman responded, putting a couple of spokes down. He had been guilty of running the ghost several points off her course, in order that what little wind there was should fill the foresail and hold it steady. He had striven to help the unfortunate Harrison— at the risk of incurring Wolf Larsen's anger. Time went by, and the suspense, to me, was terrible. Thomas Mugridge, on the other hand, considered it a laughable affair, and was continuously bobbing his head out of the galley to make jocose remarks. How I hated him, and how my hatred for him grew and grew during that fearful time to Cyclopean dimensions. For the first time in my life I experienced the desire to murder. Saw red, as some of our picturesque writers phrase it. Life in general might still be sacred, 
that life in the particular case of thomas mugridge had become very profane indeed i was frightened when i became conscious that i was seeing red and the thought flashed through my mind was i too becoming painted by the brutality of my environment i who even in the most flagrant crimes had denied the justice and righteousness of capital punishment fully half an hour went by and then i saw johnson and lewis in some sort of altercation it ended with johnson flinging off lewis's detaining arm and starting forward he crossed the deck sprang into the fore rigging and began to climb but the quick eye of wolf larsen caught him here you what are you up to he cried johnson's ascent was arrested he looked his captain in the eyes and replied slowly i am going to get that boy down you'll get down out of that rigging and damn lively about it do you hear get down johnson hesitated but the long years of obedience to the masters of ships overpowered him and he dropped sullenly to the deck and went on forward at half after five i went below to set the cabin table but i hardly knew what i did for my eyes and my brain were filled with the vision of a man white-faced and trembling comically like a bug clinging to the thrashing gaff at six o'clock when i served supper going on deck to get the food from the galley i saw harrison still in the same position the conversation at the table was of other things no one seemed interested in the wantonly imperiled life but making an extra trip to the galley a little later i was gladdened by the sight of harrison staggering weakly from the rigging to the forecastle scuttle he had finally summoned the courage to descend before closing this incident i must give a scrap of conversation i had with wolf larsen in the cabin while i was washing the dishes you are looking squeamish this afternoon he began what was the matter i could see that he knew what had made me possibly as sick as harrison that he was trying to draw me and i answered it was because of the brutish treatment of that boy he gave a short laugh like seasickness i suppose some men are subject to it and others are not not so i objected just so he went on the earth is as full of brutality as the sea is full of motion and some men are made sick by the one and some by the other that's the only reason but you who make a mock of human life don't you place any value upon it whatever i demanded value what value he looked at me and though his eyes were steady and motionless there seemed a cynical smile in them what kind of value how do you measure it who values it i do i made answer then what is it worth to you another man's life i mean come now what is it worth the value of life how could i put a tangible value upon it somehow i who have always had expression lacked expression when with wolf larsen i have since determined that a part of it was due to the man's personality but that the greater part was due to his totally different outlook unlike other materialists i have met and with whom i had something in common to start on i had nothing in common with him perhaps also it was the elemental simplicity of his mind that baffled me he drove so directly to the core of the matter divesting the question always of all superfluous details and with such an air of finality that i seemed to find myself struggling in deep water with no footing under me value of life how could i answer the question on the spur of the moment the sacredness of life i had accepted as axiomatic that it was intrinsically value was a truism i had never questioned but when he challenged the truism i was speechless we were talking about this yesterday he said i held that life was a ferment a yeasty something which devoured life that it might live and that living was merely successful piggishness why if there was anything in supply and demand life is the cheapest thing in the world there is only so much water so much earth so much air but life that is demanding to be born is limitless nature is a spendthrift look at the fish and their millions of eggs 
For that matter, look at you and me. In our loins are the possibilities of millions of lives. Could we but find time and opportunity and utilize the last bit and every bit of the unborn life that is in us, we could become the fathers of nations and populate continents. Life? Bah! It has no value. Of cheap things it is the cheapest. Everywhere it goes begging. Nature spills it out with a lavish hand. Where there is room for one life she sows a thousand lives, and its life eats life till the strongest and most piggish life is left. You have read Darwin, I said, but you're reading misunderstandingly when you conclude that the struggle for existence sanctions your wanton destruction of life. He shrugged his shoulders. You know you only mean that in relation to human life, for of the flesh and the fowl and the fish you destroy as much as I or any other man. And human life is in no wise different, though you feel it is, and think that you reason why it is. Why should I be parsimonious with this life which is cheap and without value? There are more sailors than there are ships on the sea for them, more workers than there are factories or machines for them. Why, you who live on the land know that you house your poor people in the slums of city, and loose famine and pestilence upon them, and that there still remains more poor people dying for want of a crust of bread and a bit of meat, which is life destroyed, then you know what to do with. Have you ever seen the London dockers fighting like wild beasts for a chance to work? He started for the companion stairs, but turned his head for a final word. Do you know the only value life has is what life puts upon itself? and it is of course overestimated, since it is of necessity prejudiced in its own favor. Take that man I had aloft. He held on as if he were a precious thing, a treasure beyond diamonds or rubies. To you? No. To me? Not at all. To himself? Yes. But I do not accept his estimate. He sadly overrates himself. There is plenty more life demanding to be born. Had he fallen and dripped his brains upon the deck like honey from the comb, there would have been no loss to the world. He was worth nothing to the world. The supply is too large. To himself only was he of value, and to show how fictitious even this value was, being dead he is unconscious that he has lost himself. He alone rated himself beyond diamonds and rubies. Diamonds and rubies are gone, spread out on the deck to be washed away with a bucket of sea water, and he does not even know that the diamonds and rubies are gone. He does not lose anything, for with the loss of himself he loses knowledge of the loss. Don't you see? And what have you to say? That you are at least consistent, was all that I could say, and I went on washing the dishes. End of chapter 6